important for us today to understand that we need to get involved into the things of God, to know what the Word of God is all about. And as we now approach the first celebration of the Sabbath service here in uh, LEPC, we come now to understand and know that this is a place for us to understand and realize how valuable the Word of God is in our lives and how valuable it is that we understand who it is that God has brought us to bring into your faith the living Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And so we need you to understand today that it is important for you to know what it is that you're going to do in the period of Holy Communion. But before we have Holy Communion today, we're going to ask my wife to bring expressions uh, to us from the Word of God. I introduce to some and present to others Evangelist Francis Anderson. Amen. God bless you one and all. Amen. Thanking God for another day. Thanking God for yet being saved and sanctified, baptized and filled with His Holy Ghost. Thanking and appreciating God for bringing me to this place where I am right now. Amen. If I were to start off, I'm not going to sing right now. But I just want to say, uh, it's each of us should say, it's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in need of prayer. When the word comes, it's for us to take it to ourselves. So today I asked a question, how do you characterize yourself, wise or foolish? Which one do you select? Wise is defined as having or showing experience, knowledge, and good judgment. The second part of that definition says responding sensibly or shrewdly to a particular situation. That's a wise, the definition for wise. Therefore, a wise person would be one who's able to use their experiences and knowledge in order to make sensible decisions and judgments. Foolish is defined as having or showing a lack of good sense, judgment, or discretion. Therefore, a foolish person would be one who does not exercise good judgment, discretion, and good sense. And a friend of mine, we always said, you know, people say, well, if they had common sense. Well, if everybody had common sense, it really would not, it really would not. If everybody had common sense, everybody doesn't have common sense. So it's not common. Common sense is not common. It's actually rare. So just a few questions I want to just throw out just for you to think about and ponder on as you identify yourself as either wise or a foolish person. What are you doing in your daily life as it pertains to being sanctified and living a holy life? Are you redeeming the time or wasting time? Are you more cumbered about with foolishness? Are you exhibiting the behavior God wants you to have, especially as it says adorning the gospel? Are you being patient in learning what your work is in these last and evil days? If we were just to think, when we go to our places of work, we didn't just sit there and do nothing. We performed as expected. And at the end of that particular pay period, of course, we received a check. For some we worked overtime knowing that we would receive a larger check. So we put in more work so that we can get more out of it. And because the end result, of course, was finance. For those who worked in, in other industries um, where you had to produce a certain amount of work, meaning there was, I, I call it piecemeal work. You had to do, you had to uh, maybe fill so many prescriptions. You may needed to, as an automobile person, you had to do so much on the assembly line. You had to produce a certain number. Your productivity had to be at a level 
of, of satisfaction in order for you to uh, be really get acknowledged or promoted or and or to really get your regular check. But what are we expecting to receive from God? Luke 9.23 says, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now this walk in Christ daily is 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. We don't get a vacation off from God. If you didn't think, if you didn't know that, even when you go on vacation, you're supposed to be holy. Amen. Traveling in wow. God's dis traveling in God's discretion. And then the last part it says, and follow me. Follow God. What does he want us and how does he want us to follow him? Not get in front of him, but follow him. Matthew 24, 25, 1 and 2 says, and we know this story. It says, um, okay, work with me, okay. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. Now we know, we've, we've heard this story on many a times, and I just want you to kind of dwell with me as I go in this, on this particular journey. We're each on a journey. We're living to live again. Matthew 25 and 23 says, His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou have been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And that's what we're wanting to see. We're expecting to hear at the end of our journey. But do you think you are fully prepared? Or are you operating on a wing and a prayer? You really are uncertain about your life. The most important thing we should remember is that we have not been provided with a date that the bridegroom will be arriving. Think about it. When we travel, even on an airline, they give us a, debar a departure time and an arrival time. But sometimes things happen so that the train, the plane is delayed for whatever purpose. Now, Jesus is not going to delay his coming. He's told us he's coming. We don't know when. We don't know where. Then it also, First Thessalonians 5 and 2 says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So we don't know when he's coming, but he told us to be ready. Now, in Matthew, as we go back to Matthew 23 and 3, and it, then we're going to look at the foolish persons, the five foolish first. And they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil in them. Now, the purpose of the oil was to light the way, right? So they didn't know how far they were going to go, how long it was, but they were not completely dependent prepared for their journey. Do you have what's necessary for your journey? When we're going a distance, even naturally, if you're driving, you make sure that your automobile is, has you take it to the mechanic, uh, depending on the length of your trip, to make sure everything's well. You make sure you have the oil that's been uh, replaced uh, as it should periodically. You check your tires, make sure they're okay. And, of course, you make sure you have fuel. Here, the oil for the lamp is the fuel. The fuel for us is the word of God. Now, the five foolish, and follow with me, work with me, they somewhere along the way, and we have to be careful as well. Somewhere along the way, we were not, they were not taking heed to the word of God. They let it, some things slip. So as we look at a couple of scriptures, we're going to go to Deuteronomy uh, 32 and 6. Do 
Ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise. Is not he thy father that has brought thee? Has he not made thee and established thee? Somewhere along the way, the foolish forgot who brought them to the place of where they are now. Forgot who brought them over the mountains and who took them through the sicknesses, through the pain. Somewhere along the way, sometimes the foolish person has given up and really forgot about God. Maybe sometimes the, the sicknesses, the illnesses that we've gone through, the disappointments have caused us to forget about God. Oh, it must be something wrong. I'm sick. I haven't gotten healed. So, you know, where is God? And this is what the enemy is going to tell you. You still sick, so there's no God. God doesn't hear you. Some of us, when you're on your job, maybe it was that job. No matter how hard you worked, that supervisor wasn't satisfied. You didn't get promotions or your salary increased the way it should have been. So those are, these are things that cause you to say, well, maybe I'm not right. Maybe I'm not doing this. I'm not, you know, God doesn't hear me, so I guess I am just need to leave him. Then, another situation is, sometimes even in the church building, and yeah, I'm going to talk about the church folks. You've been faithful, you've been diligent, you've been working, you've been giving your tithes and your offering, and it seems like the pastor just doesn't seem to know where you are. But Miss Buku and Brother Don't Do, they get called up all the time. So you think, mm, okay, God, mm, I guess you just, just, just have to throw me away. And there are times when we don't feel like God, not only does he not know our name, he doesn't know our, our address or anything, but that's not the time for us to give up. It's not the time for us to turn our back on God. This is not the time that we should allow these things to remove us from our steadfastness in God, that's foolishness. There are other things that can happen in our life. Second Samuel 24 and 10. And David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done wrong. Now what had happened, David was out of order. David was not allowed, he had, was told not to number the number of um, the, the, the persons in the army, the people. The only time they were supposed to do this census was early on. But here, David allowed the enemy, the devil, to influence him, to number the people, and get into a state of Oh, we have so many numbers of people and we're great. And he got caught up in pride. And God did not like that. Because it wasn't the mass numbers of people that the Israelites had anyway. They were always outnumbered. And God always had to came in and let them know. But how soon they forgot. He forgot. Because they would never have gotten to the promised land with the few people they had. But God did a miraculous work in front of them, and they forgot. But you know what? Repentance is always in order. Amen. And David asked for forgiveness. Sometimes we'll get off track. We say things. We, we kind of think ahead of ourselves. Sometimes we think fast, too fast. But that's why we can always go that was the major, one of the major reasons Jesus died. We can go and ask for forgiveness. Amen. We don't have to stay in a state of foolishness. If you note, if you note, acting, being foolish is a sin. It is a sin. Psalms 5 and 5 states, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. And that's what it is. Sin is, it, foolishness is iniquity. Mm -hmm. In Jeremiah 5.21, Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding. 
which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. It is sad to say that some have been sitting in service day after day, Bible class, training, and have not really heard and taken heed to the word of God. Foolish, sitting, sitting, but not hearing. And hearing, if you hear, you're going to apply. So you're not receiving the word of God. Why talk about, why we, we always talk about the children of Israel uh, when some things uh, about the things that they did. But believe it or not, the same thing is happening now. God has blessed us in many ways, but we still haven't seen it. God's word clearly tells us the consequences of disobedience. And you know what? There are no passes for disobedience and there are no exceptions. Amen. God is of no respect of person. More on being foolish is in Romans 1, 21 and 23. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. You may not be making images, but your behavior... Your conversations, your dress, and your actions have changed dramatically away from the teachings of holiness. That's why we must continue to be steadfast, unmovable. We have to watch the people we converse with because they will, they want to change us. Even if it's your own family, some you have to separate yourself. People nowadays especially want to change we have to watch even some of the things we watch on television because it'll get in your spirit. Oh, okay, it's okay. I can do that. No. The same salvation and what it took for us to receive salvation, that's what we need to do to maintain it. We must take extreme care not to get lost in ourselves because that's what David did. He kind of got lost in himself. Tricked by the devil into the ways and cares of the world. Losing sight that God is a sustainer, the creator of life. Mm. Man has developed many things, but what they use to develop what those items from comes from what God has created, Amen. what God has already established. So we have to watch our worshiping. And who we really are worshiping in spirit and in truth. Now, let's look at, um, but the wise, the wise, they were prepared. They didn't know when the bridegroom was coming, but they took oil with them. Wise, again, is defined as having or showing experience, knowledge, and good judgment and responding sensibly to a particular situation. Proverbs 1 and 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning mm. of knowledge, yes. but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the, love, the Lord is our loving and our reverence for God all the time. Proverbs 4 and 5, Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of thy mouth. When we hear teaching, when we take, we should take heed. We shouldn't let it slip. We should practice it. Apostles send scriptures on a daily, uh, a weekly basis, encouraging us to read and study those words. And the more we do it, the more we get it in us. Again, the oil was your fuel. The word of God is our fuel. Mm -hmm. That's what can keep, that's what takes us. That's what carries us. That's what sustained us because it's the word of God that we can call upon to take us through. The word of God is a lifter of our heads. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 
any, and then in James it says, if any lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth liberally and upbraideth not. Now, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Proverbs 9 and 9 says, give instructions to a wise man and he will yet, and he will be yet wiser. Mm-hmm. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. Therefore, it's important that we really um, hold fast to the words that's being taught. Not only for our own good, but for the good and edification of others. Because other people will be looking and are looking at us and will come to us and ask. And at that time, we need to be able to give them a sound word of God, of the hope that's in us. And that hope comes from the word of God. Matthew 7, 24 says, Therefore, whoso heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, Mm -hmm. I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded on a rock. When we received and we came to God, hallelujah, and we accepted him, he gave us his word. And if we accepted his word, received his word, ate of this word on a daily basis, when the pressures of life came upon us, We won't fall. We wouldn't falter because our hope is on a solid rock. And the rock is the word of God. And the word of God is pure. Amen. And God is not going to let us down. He will never fail. His word is true. Now, going back to the airlines, when when they experience uh, a problem and... Let me go back. When they experience problems, they'll tell you, yeah, you have to wait. But we aren't going to have to wait. When Jesus comes, we either will be ready to be caught up, either caught up in death or caught up in the clouds. When a plane, if you go to the airport and you've made your reservation, but if you're not there on time, that plane is not going to wait for you. And think about it. If you're not ready when Jesus comes, you will not be caught up in the clouds to meet him in the air. And if you're not ready when he comes for death and you are not living adequately the way you're supposed to live, you're not going to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. In closing, Luke 12, 40 says, be ye therefore ready also for the son of man cometh at an hour when you think not. Saints, we have to stay on our guard. We have to stay on our post. We cannot allow the enemy in any way, shape, form, or fashion to distract us and cause us to lose our salvation. So again, I ask you today, which are you? Are you wise? Are you foolish? God bless you. Amen. 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 We give God glory for those words of expression to the body of Christ that will involve you in understanding either you're going to be wise or you're going to be foolish. And at this stage of the game, I want you to understand that the Bible says if any man lack wisdom, you're going to ask. And when you ask, God is going to give it to you liberally and upbraid it not. We thank God for Evangelist Francis today on giving us instructions on being prepared and having extra oil in our vessels because we don't know when the bridegroom is going to come. So God bless you, Evangelist Francis. And now we're going to move forward to the second phase of this ministry today, and that is the communion. And I want you to understand today how important communion really is. And so today I want to give you verses of scripture, first of all, concerning communion, and then we're going to deal with communion because this is one of the most important sacred memorial services that the Bible includes for both the Old and New Testament. First of all, I want you to know that it is found in the book of John, chapter 6, verse 53 through 58. 
Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye cannot have no life in you. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six says, For as off as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth my death until I come again. And then I want you to look at 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four through 27. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And then in the book of Luke, Luke 22, 19 through 20, And he took bread and gave thanks and break it, and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And then in the book of Matthew, chapter 26, 26 through 28, Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 28, we find these words. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then in John chapter 6, verse 53, John chapter 6, verse 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you can have no life in you. Then Acts 2 and 42. Acts 2 and 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayer. And then finally in Isaiah 53 and 5, we find, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And so today, as we move into this most important service, this is one of the most important services that we can have in our Christian faith. I want you to understand that communion was instituted not by man, but by Jesus Christ yes. himself. Yes. And so I need you to know today why it is that we are taking the bread and the wine and why it is that we understand what it means for us in this life that we're living today. First of all, I need to say to you again that communion was instituted by Christ yes, himself, yes, yes. who has given an example to do as he has done to us, which has a great force and authority in it. He not only practiced and celebrated it himself, which gave a sufficient sanction to it, but he has commanded it of us when he said to us, as oft wow. as you do this, yes. You do this in remembrance of me. And I need you to understand today that we are in a place now where we are seeing the vibes of man trying to do what he wants to do, trying to live like he wants to live. But this is contained in the words Jesus used in the first institution of the ordinance. He said, take, eat, this is my body, drink all of this, for this is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Matthew 26, 26 through 27, and Luke 22 and 19. The Apostle Paul then expressly uh, declares that what uh, he delivered concerning these ordinances was from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he said to us this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Thus, it is not something he invented Paul, nor did he receive it of man, nor he taught it of man, but he had it by the revelation of Jesus Christ himself. And this is why it is important for us to know today how much of a sacredness and consecration this really is that we are about to do today. Because the Lord's Supper was instituted by Christ and celebrated by him, I need you to understand that he gave it to us as a memorial. And I want you to understand that this is for Christ and his church and the people of his affectionate concern that are concerned about him. His suffering was coming upon him and his soul was exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. And he that was betrayed Judas was at hand. Jesus was just about to be delivered into the hands of sinful men who would put him to death. He was ready to suffer 
and die for all of the people, past, present, and future. And at that time, and I need you to hear me today, at that time, amidst all of his sorrows, and in the near approach of Calvary, he instituted the Lord's Supper so that you and I would be a part of the relationship of his body and his blood. And so today, this is to enrich us. This is to bring us now into divine fellowship. This is to bring us into a place where we understand and know that this is an intricate part of our lives to be able to communicate and to understand what communion is all about. And so today we want to incorporate not only communion, but we want to incorporate sacred songs today that will involve what communion is all about. Uh, one powerful way to prepare for your hearts and your minds to receive the Lord's Supper is through song. And we are going today to mention several songs that are very important in the ministry of communion. One is nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. It says, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fault I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is one of the communion songs that we sing in our celebration, saying to us that I'm being washed, I'm being cleansed, I'm being made whole again by the blood of Jesus. And then the second song is there is power in the blood. It says, would you be free from the burdens of sin? There's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. The wonder working power of the blood of the lamb. There is power in the blood. There's power in the blood of the lamb. And so you see today that these songs bring us into a place where we now understand how important it is to communicate and to fellowship with kinship in the word of God. And then we have the song that says, I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain, but he washed me white as snow. And so today as we enter into this thing called Holy Communion, I want you to understand how valuable it is that God has brought us to the table to show us how important it is to observe the Lord's Supper. And so today, I want to talk about three reasons we observe the Lord's Supper. And I need you to know that beyond the fact that Christ commanded it, I need you to know why we as believers will do it. First of all, to commemorate the Lord's Supper. Because he said to us that the bread and the cup reminds us of the one-time sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And we are partakers to remember that he did it for you and for me. And then not only that, but we are to anticipate. And that is, I need you to understand with the words, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Matthew 26 and 29, Jesus anticipated a reunion with his disciples in his Father's kingdom. Likewise, he instructed them to partake the Lord's Supper in anticipation. For as oft as ye eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come again, yeah. according to 1 Corinthians 11 and 26. So it is in anticipation of what is going to happen for us in the future. And then number three is called to participate. And that's what you and I are going to do today. More than a time of passion and individual reflection to the observing of the Lord's Supper is to participate in a congregational setting, which is what we're doing today on the conference line and in Facebook Live. It tells us how to focus and to bring unity 
and the visible proclaiming of the world that we are now a part of the kingdom of God through communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we find in Paul's discussion of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he made a point that the way we participate matters. In Corinth, the celebration was not supposed to be just any kind of way, but with the unity of the church actually brought together as one body. And so Paul said that when we do this, we are to understand that the Lord's Supper is sacred, that the Lord's Supper is very valuable to us as far as an understanding of Scripture, to know what it was for it to be the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Further, the Lord's Supper is an act of proclamation, giving public testimony to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as found in 1 Corinthians 11 and 26. By observing it, we announce to those outside the church that Christ is the only way to salvation. And I need you to understand today that as we participate and involved in this, we now examine ourselves. For the Bible says, let a person examine himself. And we need to examine ourselves to see whether or not we're in the truth yes, and whether yes. or not we are professing that Jesus Christ truly and indeed is our Lord and Savior. So why do we observe the Lord's Supper? We observe it to commemorate a past event, to participate in a future event, and to participate in the celebration of life between the two of them, that Jesus has died, but he died for you and me, that Jesus rose, but he rose that you and I might have life. He's coming again to receive us into his kingdom. And as oft as we have communion, it gives us the time of fellowship to share in this important event. And so the song says, the blood will never lose its power. The blood that Jesus once shed for me as my redeemer up on the tree. The blood that set it, the prisoners free will never lose its power. It will never lose its power. It will never lose its power. The blood that cleanses from all sin will never lose its power. And so today I want you to understand as the people of God, listen to me very carefully because this is very important. Many people have communion, but they don't know what it really means. Communion is a sacred time of fellowship with God where believers remember Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. In this unique time of worship, believers commemorate the Lord's death through prayer and meditation. It is accompanied by partaking of a small piece of bread and grape juice. And I need you to understand today that when we do this, the bread commemorates the body and the juice commemorates the blood. And you need to understand today that this is so important because the Lord said, except we participate, then we have really no part with him. So Holy Communion celebrates Jesus' last supper with his disciples during the Passover. And here we as believers that is in this final meal, we celebrate and commemorate the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was shed for us on Calvary's tree. To commemorate the death of Christ, he said, this do in remembrance of me. To signify, to seal, and to apply all believers in the benefit of the new covenant. And the new covenant is found on Calvary's tree. So today, I want you to understand and hear me well. Holy Communion, listen to me, Holy Communion bears a great significance for the Christians today. People should focus on living like Christ. Jesus commanded the disciples to remember him in bread and wine. It is not necessary to receive the communion in order to remember the death. It is necessary because he commanded it that you do this. And he said, as oft as you do this, you show forth my death my burial, and coming again. And so today I need you to understand that it is not something that we take out of order. It's not something that we commence to think about. It is something that we've been commanded to do in order for us to be a part 
of the kingdom of the Lord. And so the songwriter said this, Behold the Lamb, and I need you to hear me today, Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away, slain for us, and we remember the promise made that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross, so we share in the bread of life, and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of peace around the table of the king. And so today we are moving forward now into that sacrifice of understanding what it means to have the communion, the bread, and the wine. And listen to me, the mystery of the cross, I cannot comprehend the agonies of Calvary, I cannot understand. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father wraths completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, I thank you. And so today I want you to understand finally that we're moving now into that place where communion now has purpose. Communion now has the power for us to move in unity, one with another, and at the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. Simply stated, I need you to understand, communion is an act or time of sharing in an intimate fellowship. We may not naturally associate these words with communion, but actually the synonym for communion is a closeness and unity, which makes more sense when we put it in a biblical context. Let's look at it in two different ways. First of all, let's look at it when Israel was in Egypt and they needed to be delivered. They had to slay a lamb and put the blood on the doorpost of the door so that when the angel of death passed over, it would pass over them. Now, let's look at Calvary. When we look up and see Jesus' blood being shed for you and I, it now cleanses us from the penalty of death and sin that Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. And it brings us now back into fellowship with the Father, with the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So today, how important and how beautiful this service is. I remember back in the days when we were in California, in the city of Oakland, we would have communion sometime with Bishop Ross, and he would have it in the evening because he said it was the Lord's Supper. And I want you to understand how beautiful it was with the candles moving and the bread and the wine and everybody there in fellowship singing the songs of Zion and moving in a place where we understood what it was we were about to do. First of all, to make sure that we we're confessing our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Redeemer and the Lamb of the living God. And then watching ourselves move now from a place of death into a place of life. And so this is why communion is so important to us. This is why it is so important that you understand today how sacred it is. It is not something that is common, but it is something that is unique that God is now sharing with us his son in the body and in the blood. And so today the Bible says to us that you are to be careful how you treat this. You're not to do it as an unbeliever. Whosoever therefore eat the bread or drink the cup of the Lord in an unworthy moment or manner will be guilty concerning the Lord's body and concerning his death. And so I need you to understand today that we will pray, Father, forgive us. Lead us now into that place where we understand what it is about the communion that is so sacred that you gave your only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so today as we get ready to share in the bread, as we get ready to share in the wine, we find that in the book of Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22, Hebrews 9 22 tells us that forgiveness only comes through the outpouring of blood. And that blood again is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so today, I want you to hear me that we're moving now to a place that how significant 
this is, how important it is that every first Sunday we move into that day, but now we move from Sunday to the Sabbath, and every first Sabbath we're going to celebrate the Lord's Last Supper, and when we celebrate it, it's going to bring healing, it's going to bring deliverance, it's going to bring life that flows in us, because we're now moving to the place where we're being obedient to the word of the Lord. And so I need you to understand as we get ready now to move into that place, I need you to get your cup and I need you to get your bread so that we can move forward in communion. All right. First of all, we look at the bread and we see the body of the Lord Jesus Christ that was broken for us on Calvary's tree. And he said to us, to, as he broke it, he said to his disciples, take and eat. Let us take the bread and eat it. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. As we eat it now, we're becoming a part of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ by obeying in the memorial what he said to us as a symbol. The bread symbolizes the body, the body that was broken for you and me. And then he took the cup and he looked into the cup and he blessed it. And when he blessed the cup, he saw in it your sins and my sins and how he was now going to shed this blood for you and for me. And so today we take the cup together and we drink. And we share with my wife. And then I ask you to drink with me the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray in the precious name of Jesus now as we have shared both in the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to come now into this physical frame of ours to cleanse, to wash, to renew, and to restore. You gave us the significance of this by saying that as oft as we do this, we show forth your death, burial, and resurrection until you come again. And now we're doing this as a future participation of the Lord's Supper that's going to come in the new day when you bring the new heaven and the new earth. And you sit at this table, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the friends of God will be at that table, and so will we, to share anew that the sacrifice you made was once and for all, never to be done again. And we thank you for it through the power of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. And I know it was the blood for me. It, it was my Savior's blood. Hallelujah. It was my Savior's blood. Thank you, Jesus. It was my Savior's blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross, and I know it was the blood for me. They whipped him all night long. They whipped him all night long. Hallelujah. They whipped him all night long for me. Well, one day when I was lost, 
He died upon the cross, and I know it was the blood. For one more time, I know it was the blood. Hallelujah, I know it was the blood. Thank you, Jesus, I know it was the blood for me. Yeah. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross, and I know it was the blood for me. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I know it was the blood, the blood of Jesus, just for you and for me. Thank God today that we have celebrated another Holy Communion to commemorate the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lamb of the Living God. And I don't know about you today, but in that blood, we will find healing. In that blood, we will find deliverance. In that blood, we will find joy that will bring us to a place that no matter what you're going through, you now know that you are part of the kingdom of the living God and that you will be a part of the future kingdom that is to come. May the, oh, hallelujah. God, I give you glory. I give you praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Hallelujah for the word of the living yes, God Lord, that you. moves now within my breast. Yes. Knowing now that from within and from without, mm -hmm. I have shared in the word of the living God through the bread and the wine. Today I say to you, God bless you. God keep you. God help his face to shine upon you as you move forward now in the month of July. This is the seventh month. The month of reflection, the month of being complete in the things of God. And so now we've been to the table. Hallelujah. We're set at the table in unity and we drink together in unity. We ate together in unity. So the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you and the Lord make his face to shine upon you and bring you peace. Not only in this month but in the months to come. Listen to me very carefully today. This has been a sacred part now of your life. Today I want you to go back now and celebrate and rejoice that you've been able now to do what the word of the Lord say. As off as you do this. Yes. Ah, hallelujah. hallelujah. As off as you do yes. this. You're now part of the inner workings glory, glory. of the framework of the kingdom of the living God. Jesus now has become a part of you and you have become a part of him. So God bless you today. Thank God you. keep you. Yes. Now that we've celebrated communion, we're celebrating each other in fellowship, in kinship. And remember what I told you long time ago, fellowship is two fellows in a ship going in the same direction. And because we're going in the same direction now, we're moving now in the place called joy divine god bless you this is the apostle ellie anderson saying to you on facebook live along with my wife evangelist francis anderson until we talk to you again or see you in another celebration on the sabbath god bless you god keep you god make his face to shine upon you is our prayer thank you amen amen